Hello and welcome to the Divine Renovation Podcast, where we seek to inspire and equip you to move your parish from maintenance to mission. My name's Dan O'Rourke, and with me I got Father James Mallon and Ron Huntley. Good to see you guys. Good to be here. Now, it's been really quiet around our office lately. Uh, not much going on. We've been we've been taking it easy, feet up. <laughs> yeah. Holy smokes, we are in such a beautiful but busy sprint, aren't we? Yeah. So we just did a volunteer night at St. Benedict Parish. Why don't you tell me a little bit about it, Ron? Well, it was a lot of fun. It was nice to see. We had, what, Father James, I think we had 280 volunteers out, 280 St. Benedict parishioners who've signed up to host 10 different countries uh, at the think, conference. 11. Is it 11? I think we forgot, when we had that event, we forgot Ireland. Well, so not that. Like now my, you're offending me so because I have Irish roots. Apologies to Ireland, to the <laughs> beautiful Emerald Isle. I found out we have 42, over 40 people coming from Ireland. It's beautiful. Now, so, so this is to, to the Divine Renovation Conference definitely not rolling Ireland yeah. with the <clears throat> UK. We can't do that for sure. <laughs> no, it's not. It's true. So you live in it's countries. True. Yeah. 11 yeah. countries. So last night was fun. It was an opportunity to, to really get everyone excited and focused on exactly what God's doing at St. Benedict Parish and the opportunity we have. It is a real honor and a privilege to be able to serve in this way. And I think that's the disposition of everybody there, just this willingness and openness to take part in what God is doing and play our role uh, and do something really cool to bless and love At the end others. of that event, uh, I spoke to Emery, one of our team members, and she said, you know, the, the one difference between the, the, the event this time and the one two years ago was Two years ago, there was a lot of people like asking questions and kind of a bit frenzied, like, oh, what about this? And what about that? And what about this? And whereas last night, there was just this joyful <laughs> spirit of praise. Like we, we finished the night with a time of praise and prayer so and it was powerful. beautiful. And every, like everyone, you spoke very well, Dan, you did a great job. Father Simon did, did a beautiful job and Kate. And it was, it was just, so it was an amazing night. My heart was just full of joy. It yeah. really, really was. And uh, <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what was the kind of key message that, that came through. Yeah, well, it's interesting, you know, because one of the things that we're so good at, and that I'm so proud of, and there's always room for improvement, let's face it, like, <laughs> but there really is a joyful hospitality at St. Benedict Parish. Like, we genuinely love each other and love others. And, and to be able to really hone down on that and get to the fundamentals of what it means to be hospitable anyway. And mm-hmm. talking about the disposition of curiosity when people come, mm-hmm. uh, the disposition of, of, of joy when people come. Um, and, and, you know, there's just so many opportunities to be authentic and genuine and welcome people. You know, I've walked into places at times where there's people welcoming and, and you can tell they must be on the hospitality committee, but they're talking to a friend. And you kind of walk in and you kind of glance over a few times wondering if they're going to glance at you to say hi because you know that that's probably what should take place, but they don't even. And you keep walking by and it makes you feel a little bit odd. And uh, But, you know, we want to make sure not just at the DR conference, but every Sunday we're anticipating people coming and to make them feel welcome. And, and it's going to be so many expressions of that people running buses. There's people at the theater where the breakouts are going to be like there's just we're just going to be poor in hospitality one of the things that i heard you say and i heard you say father james you both said the same thing uh, last night uh, you, you just encouraged people to be normal just be your normal selves the way you normally would come yeah. to the parish yeah. just be that uh, you know you don't have to do anything different but that means you know you're going to be hospitable you're going to be loving you're going to be curious about the people that are there just be normal but here's the thing too dan like when you're filled, when you've had a transformational encounter with Jesus Christ and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're supernaturally normal. That's right? one we of the have things an that act- Nicky Gumbel says in one of his talks, in one of his older talks, he would say to be supernaturally natural and naturally supernatural. Oh, wow. I like yeah, that. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> but, and that's the case, and people see it. Like I was just talking to Bill Scholar this morning, one of the staff members at St. Benedict Parish, and he, he was telling me about, I think the lady's name was Carol, and she. She said when she came to St. Benedict Parish, she could see Jesus in the faces of the other people's joy around her, and she just cried. Went home, told her mother. Both of them had been away from church for years. She said, you got to come. Her mother came. She cried. They wound up at Alpha, cried through the whole thing. <laughs> so, there's a lot of it's good. Good thing we're up on a hill. All the tears flow <laughs> downhill. I think... Um, You know, the one thing, and it was mentioned, I think, Dan, you brought this forth, that makes this such a special event every two years is the incarnational element. Mm. And incarnational mission is is the purest form of mission because 
what is the fundamental mission of God the Father? It was sending his son who took flesh, who pitched his tent amongst us. It's incarnational. And Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I sent you, which means I'm sending you to be an embodiment, to be an incarnational embodiment as well. And so a conference on parish renewal, good thing for it to happen at a parish, even though it's a bit more squished. <laughs> even, though things, squished. even things might not be <laughs> as, as fancy. I mean, the yeah. key thing is, is to, again, naturally supernatural, supernaturally natural, is people walk in and say, this just looks just like our place. Right. You know, and, Except and then, we have a bigger parking lot. And then the mo- <laughs> yeah, the most important thing is, and we heard this from DR16, was, was the parishioners. We heard it over and over again. Yeah, the talks were good, the music was great, and all this, but the parishioners, I know. the meeting the parishioners, that was, that was the game changer. And that's what we're so excited about. Ron, you made a couple of interesting points too about uh, of inviting us to check our presumptions. Yeah, and you know what? Yeah. There's a story that came out of that last night, which I thought was so beautiful. But one of the things is, and I got thinking about it more this morning, but you know, we're going to have people from, don't assume everybody there is Catholic. We have people coming from other traditions. backgrounds and traditions we, coming to join us. We've got uh, Lutherans, we've got Anglicans, we've got Wesleyan. Vineyards, Wesleyan. Yeah. Uh, that's what we know of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so, you know, let's make people feel welcome. And one of the points I made is if I went to a Wesleyan conference, and we've done that as a staff, um, I hope that they don't tell Catholic jokes because now I'm going to feel... I'm going to feel awkward. Like, I just want to be one of the crowd. And that's the truth. And the scripture you read last night from Colossians says, we've heard of your faith and your love for all of God's people. And that's one of the things I love about St. Benedict, that we have people who are members of our church who are not in full communion with the Catholic Church. Yeah. They're not there yet in their journey. Right. And they feel welcomed, they love, they serve, they give, they connect, they worship. But they're not Catholic yet, and that's okay. And I think it's so important. So a lady came up to me afterwards, and she said, some of the things that you talked about tonight were for me. And I, I forgot what I said, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> so I said, okay, what was that? She said, I'm not Catholic, and I'm so grateful you said that. My husband's Catholic, and we belong to this church. I belong to this church, and what you said made me feel so good. And I just thought, good. Like, let's assume that other people are going to be a part of our church, a part of our conference, a part of the mission God's given us. See, when a parish begins to become missionary in its identity and the culture shifts and you know how is that expressed you know at the offset you know engaging liturgies hospitality you know better preaching music and in something like alpha i mean we we try to reach all people yes so don't be surprised you're going to start having people effectively joining the membership of your (laughs) church becoming active members of your church who are not in full communion yet isn't that exciting? And, you know, I always, with the parishioners, and I still see, see them around, but especially when I was when I was pastor, I'd say, you know, I'd love someday to, to celebrate the sacraments with you, but I want you to know um, the fact that you might not be ready for that or ready to take that step, it doesn't change in any way the fact that you belong here and I'm your pastor. Wow. And we love having you here. So there's no, like, no pressure, right? I mean, that's so important. It's no pressure. We love you. We, we would love, we, we never kind of stop inviting. Yes. Uh, we would love you to be, to be able to get there. But but no, it's not a condition. Yeah. We're not going to think less of you if you're not ready at this point to take that well, step. Well, isn't and, that and God precisely loves us? in freedom. Exactly. <laughs> it's in freedom that we grow. Amen. Yeah, that, that, I love that last night. I think one of the other messages that came out last night was something that, we've often experienced in, in our in our use of alpha over the years is fundamentally this is this is not about you know the sum total of our human efforts are going to make this big big difference no it's about it's about creating a space for god to work mm. and that's modeled in throughout the conference especially the plenary sessions where each plenary session there's a time of prayer mm. and really okay we've 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 reflected together we've we've looked at some some things now we're going to just step back a little bit and ask that the Holy Spirit to come in and take a time of quiet, reflective prayer. And that's often when, when amazing things happen is when, as, as Paul says in his letter to the Romans, when, when God's Spirit speaks to our spirit and we cry, mm-hmm. Abba, Father, that mysterious uh, interchange there. So that it's really the whole conference is about creating a space for God to work. And, and we know and we believe, we trust, because God is faithful that in the months and perhaps years to come, we're going to hear... Great stories of what God inspired in the hearts of the men and women who are going to be there. Amen. And if there are people listening to this podcast or watching it, uh, 
if you've been impacted by divine renovation and are not connected uh, in the network or what have you, and there's been cool things going, would you send us an email and tell us? We would love to celebrate the impact it's had on your church and how it's helping you guys to reach more people with the good news. Uh, yeah, I just love that. that. That's fuel for our fire. That makes mm-hmm. everything we do worthwhile when we hear back how God is yeah. changing. And it. I feel I often feel a little bit guilty talking about uh, the conference uh, next week because right. it's sold out. Uh, it's sold out and there's a waiting list. And, you know, we, we've been tr- doing our best to accommodate people on the waiting list, but the waiting list is... is sizable in terms of what it's at right now. But the good news, the good news is that the entire conference we're going to be streaming. So you'll be able to, you'll be able to experience the plenary talks, the breakouts, the evening. So, so people who want to join, will be able to join via via social media. We'll have the live stream links being blasted out. So, so if you're unable to join, you'll still be able to, to, to to take in some of the, uh, some of the, the talks and events of the day. Right. Sounds good. Yeah. That's so helpful. And, and two, you think about the pastors and their leadership teams coming to the conference. Well, I bet you they would love to grab a, a couple of buses and bring their whole church, but their whole church can watch online back home, be praying for the people, the leaders of your church that are here, but you can take part in it too, so that when they get back, you'll be able to unpack it together, which and is fun. You've, uh, you've asked a couple of the pastors that are coming. You've asked a couple of them what they hope to achieve or what, yeah. what, what are their goals for the conference. What, what were some of the answers you got? Yeah, it's, it's really fun to ask that question because, you know, it's fun to know what people hope to get out of it. And one of my favorite answer was just the other day. Uh, my friend Father John said, when I asked him, what do you hope to get out of your the trip to the conference? He said, well, you know... We just look at it as if we're going to the circus. <laughs> Not far off the mark. He said, you know, we just can't wait to be around a bunch of other people who are leaning into these principles and ideas of renewal for the church. We can't wait to be around all the people. And I thought, that's the best answer ever. <laughs> we feel like we're going to the circus. Isn't that fun? Like, that's I awesome. thought, that's great. What a great disposition to bring to the trip because it's not necessarily... The plenary yeah. sessions I mean, are really what we're going to do. We can get together and just <laughs> have a few hymns and uh, and then just like hang out. And it would be like amazing two days because we would learn so much from each other. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and that's what I like about some of the changes to the conference this year. Yeah. There is more circus time or yeah. time to time to <laughs> unpack what we've learned and meet other people and have interesting conversations. Uh, and I think that's wise. I, I'm I'm the I'm of the I'm always of the bent. Let's make. The most of every single minute of the day, and that means working the entire time. That's I'm not. That's how I'm hardwired. But I love the wisdom that's been yeah, put into this that was one. A, that was a good move. I think instead of two one hour and fifteen minute workshops, kind of like separated by a fifteen minute break in the afternoon, being really really full, we just got, we've got one really hefty workshop time, yeah. and much more free time in either end for for longer meals and yeah. more interaction. Really encouraging people. You know, you know, don't just get together with your team hook up with another parish and, and get to know each other. And yeah. uh, so it's going to be good. So uh, one of the things that, that I know happened at St. Benedict recently is some innovation. Uh, I love it when St. Oh, Benedict gosh, looks to innovate. Yeah. And I know you got to check it out. Why don't you tell us what happened oh, just uh, so a week fun. or so ago? So fun. I love what they're doing. I love the team. I love their passion. I love their commitment to, to and that's what's so great about newness. When new people come into and something great, they often have the capacity to make it even better. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things they've done is they've created something they call beta. So a follow-up to alpha. And, you know, the summer, one of the problems that we have, and probably most of the people that are implementing divine renovation, you'll be able to relate to this too. There's a big break between when the last alpha is over Mm -hmm. and then summer and when the next one starts. And it is what it is. Like we've tried to convince people to do them in their homes over the summer with minimal success. And Anyway, they decided, the staff decided, what would it look like if we did one Friday evening a month, four months in a row over the summer, as an opportunity to take the people who've just completed Alpha and invite them to keep coming out so that collectively as a parish, we stay connected to these people. We make it easy for them. So they called it beta. And so here's what it looked like. It starts at seven o'clock on a Friday night and it goes to 8.30. So it's not really long. You get there, you have snacks, everybody's mingling. And remember, most of these people have already done Alpha. However, you're welcome to invite anybody you like. Maybe if somebody would like to do Alpha with you, you can invite them to this. There's zero commitment. You don't have to sign up for it. You don't have to register. You just show up. And then, uh, and then what happens is you have snacks. You sit down. MC welcomes you, introduces a speaker. Uh, Rob McDowell spoke, gave a great talk about 
15, 20 minutes long. Then we broke into small groups at our table. We didn't break into them. We stayed at our table mm -hmm. and unpacked it just like you would on an alpha night, except nobody's necessarily assigned to be the leader or anything. It's just very organic. And then, uh, and we also did an icebreaker. Sorry, I forgot about that. Did an icebreaker so you get to know the people at your table, which was great because I didn't know any of the six people I sat with. And, uh, and then after the small group discussion, we had some praise and worship time. It was electric in there. There was like over a hundred people in there. It was so much oh. fun. And let me tell you this really cool story. I can share it with you. So four of the six people just finished the daytime alpha, which is just getting over today, actually. So it's just getting coming to a conclusion. So they were there. And so we're introducing ourselves. And I asked the guy beside me, how did you hear about alpha? He said, well, I've been away from the church for years and years and years. And I had a friend invite me. So I came. I said, that's fantastic. I said, how about you guys? He says, well, we're not from here. I said, okay, have you had a chance to do Alpha? They said, no, we haven't done Alpha. So you're, you haven't done Alpha, you're not from here. Uh, yeah, we're not Catholic either. Okay, cool. So <laughs> how did you get here? They said, oh, well, he invited me. So the guy that's been away from the church forever uh, invited his buddy to come check out Beta. And so I said, oh, great. So did you invite him too? He said, no, i never seen him in my life. I said, well, how did you get here? He said, this guy invited him. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my gosh. Like, you know, if you look at the game plan, we want to become an invitational parish. I'm sitting in an invitational parish. Well, it gets even better. <laughs> then one of the guys beside me, when he hears that these guys haven't done Elphia, he gives this just beautiful encouragement. Hey, you know what? Here's where I was. Here's the difference Alpha made for me. Here's what it's doing in my life. I'm totally different. And, you know, if you haven't done Alpha, really try Alpha. Well, it turns out the guy beside me, I find out later, he... He was a self-proclaimed atheist 10 weeks ago. And I'm thinking, this is crazy. Like, what is, this is crazy. And so anyway, that's one of their innovations. I just think it's so cool that they're doing this. And it was a wild success. And I think, I think next week or next month, it'll be even bigger because it was so fun, mm, so great. electric, so easy, so low commitment that it's easy as pie to bring anybody you want there and and you don't even have to invite them to Alpha because everybody at your table is going to. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Summer months can be really hard, at least here in Canada, right? Because I know in our weather is, is is really cold in the winter. And so when the nice weather comes in the summer, it is hard to get people to, to want to, you know, plug into church. They, they want to be outside. And so I know it's been a struggle over the years for the for, to get people into to Alpha during the summer months. And I don't think we actually cracked the nut, but I love that the, the Alpha Beta thing, that, that that's one new innovation to try and attack it to see if we can figure out how to get people connected in those summer months. Mm, it's really cool. You, you look at HTB, Holy Trinity Brompton, where Alpha originated and is still going strong. They actually do do it three seasons a year. And we tried that too. I put everything I had into it. But because of the nature of our culture and the flow of our culture, I found it was so countercultural that the amount of energy and effort it took to do it, it didn't quite mm. seem to be able to, to mm. you know, make it happen. And so you don't do it, but then I didn't, you know, we didn't replace it with anything. We had good ideas, but again, then you get new leadership in at St. Benedict Parish with new commitment and they innovate and they come up with a solution that was just electrifying. And also, I mean, another difference is that our morning alpha starts later in the year than the than the winter evening alpha. So in one sense, like you, you said, that it, it finished today. I mean, it's, the, it's... That's a good point. That means we only get a couple of months in the year when there's no kind of big size alpha running, which mm -hmm. is, which is actually not too bad. No, uh, it's no, not it's bad, not. but this is a but now we got fantastic beta. idea. Now we got, now beta. Beta. Now we got beta. So last time we, we talked about the uh, Pentecost challenge. So of course, just as a reminder, that's the, the invitation on Pentecost for people who've had their lives radically transformed, that she's become Lord of their life to stand up and come forward. And we give a blessing over them. We had so many amazing stories from, from parishes in divine renovation network yeah. that, that stepped into that and, and tried it. Uh, are there any new ones? Anything else have we heard recently? Well, it's fun because of course I've been coaching since then and talking to the churches in the network, which is fun. So yeah, I've been hearing some really good stories. Every single person, this is not going to be any surprise to you, Father James, was petrified. <laughs> it's, it's the, I, I, what, you mean what, the priests? The priests, yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah, probably their yeah. teams as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so, and most of them did it anyway. I was talking to one, uh, one of our network parishes yesterday, and I said, did you do it? How did it go? Because this is their second year in the network. And he, they said, well, Saturday night, it was right on the tip of my tongue, and every tip of my tongue, totally chicken, chicken, chicken out. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you better not chicken 
know the next year. I understand. <laughs> Check it I out know. At so Saturday do Saturday Night Mass. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I, I've all, I almost, I almost did it myself a few times. <laughs> you know what Michael Leclerc did on Saturday? He made sure he ha- had one person he knew. <laughs> Will you please come to Saturday Night Mass? Because I can't stand. I can't stomach the humiliation. He stacked the deck. He stacked the Just Saturday with one night. person. Just, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, fair enough. Like if that's what makes. You know, you know, because it is it's horrifying. You know, it's like creating a party and nobody shows up. It's like, it's embarrassing. So anyway, I do totally get it. It takes so much courage to do this. And uh, one person did get a, uh, a telephone call. It was funny that, uh, you know, that this parishioner was really offended by this. And it, and it was it was too Protestant, she said. And um, and so we talked about how we handled that and what what. Mm-hmm. But you know, this whole church, one person called. But isn't it interesting, right? Because we we measure what we value. That's right. And we don't measure changed lives in the church, other than how many people get baptized as adults at the Easter vigil or, or brought into the church. And there's it's so the many thing. other. I remember things. years ago when I first arrived at Saint. Benedict Parish, and I started preaching about evangelization and discipleship. The same thing, Father. Right. That's Protestant, right? So it was like that just got me going. <laughs> so they got a steady stream for three years of quotes from John Paul and Pope Benedict and <laughs> the bishop, our own, own bishop here. And is that like, Catholic enough for you? Right. You know, like this is the whole point. This is actually Catholic. Right. This is this is this is this is the original flavor, and it's coming back. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> right. It's so true. I I don't know at what point we've. We've delegated bringing people into a relationship with Christ to the evangelicals. Like, why, why have we done that? Like, <laughs> we yeah. can do both. We can enjoy sacred liturgy and tradition and continue to bring people into the fullness of life, which is a relationship with Jesus and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's Catholic. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to bring us off there because I'm excited because we're going to bring Father Simon Lobo on. We haven't had a chance to talk to him about his book, so I want us to I want us to bring him in, and we're going to have a chance to, to chat about the book that he published not too long ago, and it's going to be a real exciting chat. We'll be right back. Have you ever read books or listened to talks on parish renewal and leadership and thought, that's good for them? <laughs> But how would that ever happen in my parish? And do these people even know what it's like to be in a parish? How do you bridge the gap between the theory and real life parish? The Divine Renovation Association exists for all those reasons. It's created for and by people who have lived it and are living it right now in real life parishes. I believe that every parish has the potential to impact the world around it. I believe that every leader has the capacity to be a better leader. I believe that every parish can be so much better and more exciting than it currently is. And we want to help with that, to help you and your team to move your parish from maintenance to mission. We are so excited to have Father Simon Lobo, pastor of St. Benedict Parish and author of Divine Renovation Apprentice. Welcome, Father Simon. It's good to have you. Thanks very much, Dan. Now, you've been on the podcast before, but you actually stood on this side of, of the bar. That's right. Uh, was, it was easier to elbow you from that side. Yeah, well, this time, he, you, you see how often he kicks me under this bar. It's insane. <laughs> <laughs> I, I almost preferred it when you were here. It's <laughs> less painful. Yeah, yeah. less painful indeed. But we're excited because we wanted to bring you on because you, you published your book not too long ago. And uh, we haven't really had a chance to explore it and talk about it and even just the process of it coming together. Mm -hmm. But before we talk about the process, why don't you just tell us what the book was about? What's the core of the book? It's, It's essentially a series of reflections. There's about 50 of them in all that highlight my experiences primarily during the first year that I was at mm-hmm. St. Benedict. Mm-hmm. So once a week, I wrote a reflection, something I was learning in real time. And and I thought at first, am I going to have enough content to write? Boy, did I ever add that and then some. And just little, it's often little stories connected with a principle mm-hmm. and, and then a takeaway, a practical application. And uh, we used really this, uh, this, sheet in preparing our homilies at St. Benedict that Father James had produced. What do I want people to know? What I want them to do? Why does it matter? Three really important questions to to clarify and focus a message. And so I used a couple of those at the end of each chapter. What do I want people to do? What's the one takeaway I want you to have and what I want you to do? So you can't read this book. I mean, you can read this book any way you like, but, but hopefully you'll read it and say, well, 
each chapter, there's, there's something that I can do. There's a way in which I can respond. Right. And do you know one of the things that I get so excited about, each chapter is probably only about two pages, and very rarely can I read a chapter a night because I'm a slow reader, and so I just find that exhilarating. I've, I've had some friends say that it's a wonderful bathroom reader for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> you can get through the chapters. <laughs> so the book has actually an interesting origin story. It, it was, um, you didn't set out uh, to write a book at first, right? So how, how did we get a book? Well, I never intended to be an author, I'll tell you that for sure. Uh, I'm not even very good at grammar and stuff. So I, I, it was a series of people all around the same time as I was beginning at St. Benedict in the summer of 2015 who had suggested trying to capture some of my learnings. It started with a friend in Ottawa who had been at my first parish, uh, an amazing leader in business and, and just a brilliant guy. He said, he used this term, diffusion of innovations. There's so many innovations happening at St. Benedict Parish. How are you gonna diffuse them? In other words, the, I, and this wasn't even on my radar, but to go in with the sense of generosity that right from the get-go, you have to diffuse, be willing to diffuse mm. and share what you're learning with others. <laughs> so and great. so I was like, wow. And he actually, if John's watching or listening to this, he gave me this this thick book on this topic and I, it's sitting on my bookshelf. I haven't read it yet. <laughs> not it's a bathroom actually, reader, right? It's, it's, no, it's not. It's not. It's weird. Like, I haven't even read that many books. What, I have no business <laughs> writing a book. But anyways, uh, so that was one. And you yourself, Father James, you had, I think in one of our first one-on-one -on -one meetings, you had proposed that. Yeah, I think that when you write, you know, you, when you put something in words, you have to, you have to pull together a number of different elements and there's, there's the kind of I knew there would be a lot of information, new mm -hmm. ideas, mm -hmm. reading books, conversations with 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 new principles, and then there's the the lived reality because we were like we were chucking stuff on you. <laughs> Let's see how he does with this one. <laughs> <laughs> and there were some things that we knew were, were going to be really hard, and, it's, and then Thank just you for that. So processing the experience you're learning, and then realizing that that in the church that that most of the, the reason why we do what we do is because deep down we believe we're supposed to do it there's a mm. there's a an operational theology mm. uh, that we that often we're not even conscious of and so it was like how do you challenge that operational theology that op operating system and 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 the best way to do it is to put it in writing it i remember that when i we had, we talked about once a week mm. from the the very first one i got i thought this is good it was gold this is this is really good. The second one was even better. Uh, <laughs> third one, I was like, oh, yeah, this is, uh, I think this is more than just weekly reflection because mm -hmm. also the, the idea was to send them back home to your brothers exactly. so they could be kind of informed with what was going on. Yeah, I should mention that Bishop Scott, a good friend of yours and the former superior of my community, who's the reason I came here in the first place. Thank you, Bishop Scott. Uh, he, had, he had also said something along these lines, like i love for you to be to be capturing, writing reflections, sharing them with the community. So so to I would send out this weekly email blast to my brothers and the Companions of the Cross. And I don't know, like some of them maybe were reading them, some of them like I get so many emails that I don't read. And and yeah. but but a few of them would reflect back and say, Hey, thanks for writing that, or there's something you said in there that that really touched me or I could I, I needed to hear that. So I thought, cool and and I didn't want to impose it on anybody, certainly, but but just wanted to share. And if if people are interested, and not all of my brothers, of course, are doing parish ministry, but for those that are, mm -hmm. and and who feel that same sense that we just can't keep doing what we've been doing because it's mm -hmm. not working, uh, they I think those were the ones who really picked up and and started to follow along. And technically, this is not the first time you've been published, of course. Because there's about that twelve of these of the original reflections we incorporated into the Divine Renovation Guidebook. That's correct. So yeah. in fact, yeah, you're you're right there in that in that book, other book as well. True. And thank you for that, Father James. I think that was real forward thinking of you to to try and help launch that and, and grow an interest that some of those practical stories and whatever could could really capture something that uh, that others who have been following the Divine Renovation story might, might mm. find fascinating. One of the things I find so fun when you came, because you came as an apprentice. Mm. Like it was very intentional. It wasn't just, oh, here's the next priest that's gonna be helping out Father James. No, like you say, with Bishop Scott's vision and his friendship with Father James to say, hey, is there something we can do? And, and so you came as an apprentice. And man, was it ever fun to see our church through your eyes, mm -hmm. because we'd been 
mm-hmm. you know, in in it for quite some time and engaged and and you came at a time not long after our huge structure shift, which yeah. really changed everything, not so much on the outside, but on the inside. Yeah. And you had a really big part to play in in creating, helping create the final version of our game plan. And so you really involved in our story at a at a really neat time in history. So this book is a neat snapshot. It yes. was so fun to watch and listen to your observations because it was like it was making things new again. Mm-hmm. And I found it so much fun. One of the, I, I don't want to embarrass you, uh, but it's actually kind of astounding just how many endorsements you have in this book. <laughs> it's roughly the length of one of your chapters. <laughs> Because there is a lot, and, and from some really, really incredible people. And I know the, one of the ones on the back, and I know there's a quote here that, that really does uh, sort of land from Father Michael White, mm-hmm. uh, author of, of Rebuilt and pastor at, uh, at Nativity. And he says, every great leader is an even great learner. Mm-hmm. Isn't that true? Oh, and that's, that's really at the heart of it, Dan, that I am learning. I came here with the hope of learning, and I have learned, and I continue learning. Mm-hmm. I mean, as recently as yesterday, Ron and I were meeting, doing doing some planning, and just having a blast as we're we're preparing for for the conference and some of what we're going to be sharing with the delegates. And he was sharing stuff with me, and I was I'm like, I just learned something about myself <laughs> yesterday morning. Oh, I had no idea. You just sh- uh, shined a light onto something that was so helpful for me, and I hope I hope that for myself and for anybody who reads this and that we never stop mm-hmm. learning mm-hmm. every mm-hmm. single day of our lives that to the day I die, that I'm going to keep on learning. And I think that's, that's the secret weapon of a leader is to be a learner. And as you learn, you, you, you apply. And when you apply what you've learned, um, sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't go so well, but even in the times that doesn't go well, you learn. And then because of the, the combination of those things, you find the, the, the thing you're leading, your church, to be in a different place. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my goodness, I once again, I don't know what to do anymore. I need to learn. Need I need to learn, to learn more. more because we're, it's a living, breathing thing that if you're going on mission, you're actually moving it. You're moving it. And that's the tension with with a leader. You know, the tension between uh, leadership and, and, and management are always in tension. You know, a, mm. a leader will constantly move a thing to another place. Management will say, okay, now that we're here, let's make it really good. Yeah. Let's make it make, really operate really well here in this place. But mm. but it's And you need that healthy tension between the two. But leadership is, is always moving to another place. Yeah, because once you kill the innovation, what ends up happening is you suck the fun right out of everything. And so there needs to be this constant innovation, this constant learning, because Unless when you're a management person, because for, for management people, they that's a lot of fun. I know it's hard to... <laughs> 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 I don't even know what to say to that. It's, it's, it's like, like, going to be another fist fight here. <laughs> it's like accountants and spreadsheets, you know, like they, they, they just seem to like them. I don't yes. know. <laughs> right. But, and I'm not saying it's not necessary, but that tension is needed. Yes, and one right. of the things that can happen with managers is people that really like process really want more process people around them because it's never there's you can always do better, always do better. and so what ends up hap- what can end up happening in and the book that uh, predictable success that Kerry Newhoff does uh, interviewed the author he talked about the fact that when that happens what'll happen is the people that started the organization or started the movement they can get squeezed out because it gets so process oriented that there's no space for innovation anymore and so a great organization that continues to grow. And that's so fun. To, we had a meeting the other day with the St. Benedict Parish staff and mm-hmm. Divine Renovation staff, and we just talked about what's new. And you guys listed all these things you've been doing different. I couldn't have been more jacked. Like the innovation that's happening in St. Benedict is so good. And that's the tension you need to have in organizations. Mm-hmm. And some churches stopped innovating years ago. We've married ourselves to the methods. It's like we finally found the way to do things. So now we don't have to innovate anymore more let's just keep doing this and shame on people who don't like this because this is the best way and if they don't like it they can leave. there's also the other temptation or the other possible pitfall that some of us are more likely to <laughs> fall into that is like, let's just just keep doing new things more and more and more and more and and the, the, i don't know anybody the, like that the systems <laughs> people are coming behind trying to keep up you know you're off, off to the next thing and so uh, there is definitely there is a, a balance a healthy balance <laughs> like so father simon I've, I've never been an author i've never got a published book with my name on it um but i've got to imagine 
that as, as, as it went to publication, as it went to print, and the very first copy off the line, as you picked up the very first copy, <laughs> it must have been so exciting. Well, that's not exactly how it <laughs> happened, Ed. Somebody else <laughs> got the first copy. How did you tell us about how it that happened? It felt so good for me to when have you, the first copy uh, of the first, you got You got to do have the first sniff of my book. How, how was that for you, Ron? I never thought to sniff it, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. But it was really fun because I was at a Holy Family Parish in Maryland where the publisher is, uh, Word Among Us Press. Yep. And so I was doing a mission there, and I didn't know, but they said, hey, and after the session, the pre-release of Father Simon's book is out in the lobby. You can buy it. I was like, what? I was so excited for you because I know that writing, you know, writing the reflections and then what it meant to turn that into a book, mm -hmm. that wasn't an easy process, mm -hmm. and that was going back and back and yeah. back, and I know how hard it was. So I was really excited for you. Mm -hmm. I really was, and it was fun to put my hands on it so and get a copy so that I could put it in your hands. It was important. And actually, you're the one that took it from me. Father James said, I got to give this to Father Simon. <laughs> I was happy to give it. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, that was, that was a surreal. I remember that day when that book showed up. Thank you for passing it on. Thank you. You know, it passed a few hands and I eventually got it. And that it was a Friday afternoon, I think. I had, I had been working from home maybe in the morning, maybe working on a homily or something. And I came into the office at St. Benedict and it was there and some of the staff were around Kate and Matt and a few others and just kind of casually I think had had said it somewhere where I'd find it and I, I picked it up and it was it was there was this emotion I was overcome mm. and I couldn't do anything the rest of the afternoon I mean we took a few <laughs> stage photos we have a, we have a Pope Francis uh, standee so I, I was giving him a copy of my book and, <laughs> and but anyway it was just like I guess they talk about not that I would know but you know having a child and giving birth in the nine months or whatever yeah. and just that sense of this is real this is real it, and it's just a lot of the same ideals that were just in a bunch of emails, really. So that was the that was the first copy. That was the smuggled book, the one that yes. got snuck across the border in in, in Ron's suitcase. <laughs> I'm sure he claimed it in customs. Uh, but then we also uh, we actually have a video of when the rest of the oh, of yes. the book showed up when the boxes showed up. So why don't we take a quick second and take a look at that? <laughs> I don't have the strength. Oh my, don't say that alone. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna cut myself here. It's like Christmas morning, so it's like, oh, hey. oh. Hold it up for the camera. Oh, wow. oh it's Father James' book. It's more than that, it's more than that. So Father James said I have to stick hey, my hey. nose in it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, who wants one? <laughs> we, need a, we need a book cannon. I can just... <laughs> That's yes. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That was wicked. That was, oh, man. That I couldn't open the stupid box. <laughs> <laughs> that, that day was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. I'm so excited that the book has, has had the kind of reception it's had, too. Well, let me ask you, Father James, because I don't want Father Simon to be on the spot. What For, for the parishes that are, are, are diving into divine renovation, what are your hopes for them when they pick up this book? Well, I think the most important thing about this book is that I didn't write it. Mm. I, that's, that is, a, in that sense, the medium is the message. It's a very, very important message because, you know, those who would perhaps be a little, a little, maybe a bit doubtful about this whole enterprise, generally draw from their experience, and it's fair, that, that, that renewal in parishes really boils down to two things. Either you have a very highly charismatic leader or a workaholic. Mm. Uh, and that's it. Now, there might be elements of that, but, but that, simp that explains it. And, if you, and if, you, if you lift those two principles out, then what are you left with? But nothing. Which means that what they're really saying is they're, that renewal or health, organizational health, which, begin, which brings fruit, is not in any way rooted in any particular principles. Mm. There's, there's, there's nothing you can humanly do. Uh, to make things better, which, which kind of is an over spiritualization because it's God does everything. There's n there's nothing we need to do. So it takes puts us off the hook. Mm -hmm. uh, we're we're really off the hook. And I think what this book 
identifies is, is it zones in in a very accessible way some key operational principles that, and there are many ideas in this book that were not in the original book because mm. we're constantly learning. Mm. I mean, the St. Benedict Parish you came into it was in your first year was not the same St. Benedict Parish that was around when we wrote the book. And it, and it certainly wasn't um, the same same St. Benedict Parish, when you finish your last reflection, we're constantly moving and growing. So I think that idea that, that it's enunciating these core principles uh, in such a, a clear way that can be passed on to others is, is a, a very important message because there are things we can do to move our parishes in the right direction. Not all parishes might move at the same rate or the same pace. That's not important. The question is, what way are you moving towards, towards, towards uh, decline or even towards maintenance or towards mission. Mm -hmm. And I have some people when in the network <clears throat> that sometimes they'll say, well, I'm not Father James. And and I'll tell you, it irritates the daylights out of me because it's like, have I ever asked you to be Father James? Nobody expects you to be Father James. Nobody. God, you're fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. And you have a responsibility and we'll help you in the network figure out who that is, what it looks like, so that we can build a team around you, define what success looks like or what fruit looks like, and orient everything to go and get it. It's not, you do not have to be Father James to implement these principles and bring more and more people home to God. Mm -hmm. And Thanks Father, and Father James, for Father James by himself ain't that good. <laughs> you, know, you know what? I was just thinking. I, I when I came to Saint Benedict, I had no intention of writing a book. But one thing that did drive me was this whole. I believe it's a, a lie or a myth that you have to be Father James or you have to be this one super gifted individual in a in a particular context, and that's the only way this will work. And I was driven in a way to to disprove mm. that. And so, again, maybe this is one tangible example of how that's not true. You don't, there, this could be for everyone. And if we could, I'd love to share just a little bit about the process of writing the book, because mm. even that in itself, as you, you share all the time alone, you're, you're not that great. Even this book is a team effort. Mm. It really is. I mean, I mean, I was getting feedback on the emails, encouragement, you know, I was sending them out to the senior leadership team. So Kate and Rob, they're always, you know, very encouraging and you guys were as well. And, and I remember once or twice, I, I got an email back from, from either of you just saying, hey, you know what, that last reflection, I, I felt like there was something missing in that. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, and, uh, and my first reaction was like, how dare you, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be an author someday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but that was helpful. And then the whole process of having even multiple editors who, who came alongside and took, you know, a guy who doesn't know much about grammar and really, really refined and improved it, made it more readable. And, and through that process, a, a lot of the stuff, I, the, I realized the audience had changed. So I was originally right. yeah, trying to just right. share some emails with your brother companions, guys who know me, who've known me for, for years and years. Right. Uh, and and I realized, well, what if this needs to be offered to a broader audience? And and so there was some of the inside jokes or that right. kind of stuff was removed. And I was, you know, really attached to that. And I, th I again, I thought, you know, what do you know, a professional editor? Like I'm, yeah, <laughs> I, I know better. And, what could and, you possibly and, know? <laughs> and, and, and it's like I had to learn again. And and that actually tied in with an interesting blind spot that you had identified in me, Father James, just being at St. Benedict, presiding, preaching, the, just the odd time saying something in a way that was directed to the insider without an awareness of the outsider who that one person who might've walked in the very first time mm -hmm. in church in, in years and saying something that would just not intentionally, but somehow mm -hmm. make them feel a little bit excluded and I thought, oh, wow, I'm doing the same thing as I'm writing. And so that was a, I mean, so much humility, my mm. goodness, too, as it's being pared away and just crafted in such a way with, with all this help from, from other readers. And, and then I remember at one point, Deacon Keith was involved, too, a good friend of St. Benedict. And, and then one of our staff, Matt Vaughn, he and I got in a room and with a big whiteboard and, and we, we went through all 50 chapters and said, you know what, if Deacon Keith had started this process to say, what if we reorder them a little bit thematically rather than mm. just chronologically, mm. again, for the sake of people, readers, readers who, who don't really know the story or wouldn't. 
And he and I, he really helped me. He's got a, he's a gifted writer himself. And I look forward to reading. Taking Keith Storms, right? I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. talking actually about Matt oh, now. Matt, okay. So Matt and I were in a room. So Matt and Kate, I'd love to read a book that they write somewhere sometime in the future. They're both very gifted writers. But uh, he, Matt helped me to really say, you know what? I think this is a good flow. And maybe these, there's three main sections, one on, on culture, one on strategy, and then one on leadership. And how can we, we rejig the order to make it as easy as possible for someone to follow? So at every step of this, mm. uh, it's been a team effort. Mm. And so I'm just privileged to be part of it. I think a few weeks back, um, we had one of the most amazing nights at St. Benedict Parish, mm. where uh, you know you really got to, to see just how much of a team was involved. Because it wasn't just the people that, that helped you uh, through the actual writing process, but it's the people that helped form the story by being parishioners yes. at St. Benedict. Yes. And so we came together a few weeks back, and we celebrated the publishing of the book. We celebrated the, the amazing work that you put into it. Uh, mm. You know, All humility aside, you worked hard to get it done. And so we had, we had a number of speakers. And i got to be honest, Father Simon, I had a favorite that night <laughs> and it wasn't me and it wasn't, it wasn't you. you it wasn't you your parents gave the most amazing oh, talk yes. that night it was such a joy to hear them i get the first word and he gets the last word <laughs> hello everyone my heart is filled with joy and thanksgiving as we celebrate this awesome event in Simon's life today, Father Simon's life today. <laughs> it is my blessing and privilege to be Father Simon's earthly mother. Mine is the womb that bore him. And therefore, great is my responsibility to hear the word of God and to keep it, as per Jesus' words in Luke 11, 27. So let me share with you the two scripture verses that are uppermost in my mind right now. The first one, Luke 1, verse 49. God, who is mighty, has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Amen. Number two. Luke 2, 51. Like Mary, our heavenly mother, I will continue to ponder all these happenings in Father Simon's life in my heart. And I will continue to entrust Father Simon to the Lord that he may grow steadily in wisdom and age and grace before God and men. Congratulations, my son. And thank you all for supporting Father Simon as he strives to live out God's holy will one day at a time. Okay, I don't have a womb. But I did my share of parenting Father Simon. And Maria and I are so thankful to our Lord for him and that he is now a published book author. <laughs> Father Simon, I wouldn't imagine that there's much in this deal for you, but I hope your book goes out of print several times for the benefit of your publisher who we met <laughs> and for the benefit of the church. I mean, I am hopeful that Father Simon has given due credit to Father James and to the whole staff and all the parishioners of St. Benedict's who welcomed him, uh, loved him, fed him, uh, <laughs> mentored him as his priesthood and pastoring skills were divinely renovated and this book was conceived. <laughs> I have to get this off my chest. This having Father Simon in Halifax 
has been a big cross for me. Not so much for Maria. On Father Simon's ordination day, when our Archbishop called him forward and he left our pew, Maria had this premonition that Simon no longer belonged to us, but to the church. I did not have these feelings. <laughs> Father Simon, you will always be my Simon boy. Some of you may know that I breed uh, Pembroke Welsh Corgis. We breeders are always hoping and praying for that perfect puppy. Well, Father Simon came close to being a perfect puppy. Uh, uh, I mean, a child. This. We felt blessed and knew he was especially talented by God. We did not realize that Father Simon worked very hard. He worked hard to be accepted, to be included. It was only in his late teens that he discovered his true identity as a beloved child of the Father. We all know bad habits are hard to break. Even though Father Simon knew his true identity, he continued to be a hard worker and an overachiever. I've lost my spot. <laughs> but in one area, he has been forced to slow down. He now drives his car more sanely. <laughs> and uh, going up hills, uh, cyclists have been seen overtaking him. <laughs> OK, here comes my plug. I hope you all go home with an autographed copy of Father Simon's book. Simon Boy, do I have to buy one? <laughs> or do your parents get a complimentary copy? God bless you all. It was in such a great night. It was so well, much fun. I'll tell you what, with all due respect to you, Father James, you're not the first person to apprentice me. Uh, right. My, my yeah. parents sure. have been disciples from the beginning of their marriage. Mm. And so all of us kids growing up, they were apprenticing me as a follower of Jesus my whole life. So that was the, the foundation, joining the Companions of the Cross, apprenticed as a seminarian and then a priest, and, and now coming here. So, yeah, I mean, if we're honest, all of us, we've been... We've been mentored by so many people in this in this journey towards God. You know what's unique about you? And I, I know, no, I shouldn't say unique. Other people have this trait too, but what makes it so important and I think what makes this book so great and what makes what's going to continue to help you grow as a pastor <clears throat> is your willingness to learn. You have a willingness to learn mm. and you will receive things even if they're difficult. Uh, you're not afraid to weigh in and wrestle it out with the people talking to you. Mm -hmm. um, you have this humility and willingness to learn. And sometimes we can lose that along the way. And you know, if you're listening to this podcast now and you're a pastor and you're not sure where you sit with that, mm -hmm. ask some of the people around you, say, you know what, when it comes to learning, humility, and, and even hunger to learn, on a scale of one to 10, where would you put me? And if it's anything less than a seven, uh, maybe you can ask them how you could change. Because yeah. I'm telling you, we can't be great by ourselves. And to your point, on, on my own, <laughs> I ain't that good. <laughs> I don't think any of us are. And, and that's, I think, that some of the magic behind this divine renovation movement is we're not asking anybody to do it by themselves. But boy, if you're not, if you don't have the same disposition you have, Father Simon, to learn and to grow and this hunger to be better, 
you're not going to be better. <laughs> I'll tell you right now. <laughs> I'd love to be a better tennis player. Guess what? I don't spend any time practicing. What are the chances I'm going to be a better tennis player? What are the chances I'm going to be Bill Scullard at tennis someday? I'd say they're pretty small <laughs> unless I work at it. Well, being a leader takes work. It takes humility. It takes hunger. And you have all those traits, and that's what makes this book so amazing. And I hope that it inspires some people that may have drop down a little bit on that learnability scale, that teachability scale, that hunger scale, and say, you know what, I'm going to double down again because I know in my heart I can be a lot better. And we know you can, we can all be a lot better too. Absolutely. Father Simon, it was such a pleasure to have you on today. And so your book's available through through all the major retailers. And for people who are coming to the conference, uh, we're, we've ordered a bunch, so we'll have copies there. And I'm hoping, uh, we haven't put it in the schedule, but I'm hoping you'll be willing to walk around with a pen. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and if anybody who comes exciting. to the conference, will buy the book there, and they'll also be able to get it signed uh, by Father Simon. Uh, I guess anybody would be willing to sign it, but it's more exciting <laughs> when, when you're the guy who signs it. <laughs> Some selfies and things like Absolutely. that. Some pictures. Yeah. Uh, and for those, uh, for other, Everyone else who's looking to, to connect with Divine Renovation, our website's a great way. But can I encourage you? Can I encourage you to download the Divine Renovation app? Um, so the Divine Renovation app's available in the App Store. And it, it has this podcast. It has other things in it, the news and other things that we try and push out. Like one, one, one thing I've learned in the last week or so is that some people actually struggle with getting podcasts. They don't know how to get a podcast. And, you know, I, I, wanna, I want us all to love those people and, and recognize, <laughs> though, that, that to make it easy for them, if you're looking to share this podcast, one of the ways to do that is to get your friends, your colleagues, your pastor to download the app. It's an easy way for someone who's, who's not familiar with podcasts to still be able to, to get, get the information, to experience the conversations that we have here. So I encourage you to, to download the app if you haven't already and to encourage those around you to as well. God bless and we'll see you next time.